All right, shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome to Revelation chapter 6, Parak Vav. Okay, let's open up in prayer. This is where it starts getting explosive. Mm -hmm. And if y'all studied this week on Revelation 6, uh, and by the way, I want to hear everybody's insights for sure. Like if anybody has a comment or said, hey, uh, matter of fact, we were talking with Anthony, saw something for the first time uh, just reading this. And I did too, just looking into this. I'd never really noticed the correspondence between the four creatures and the four horsemen. But with that uh, said, let's, uh, let's open up in prayer and we'll go through Revelation chapter 6. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we just pray, Lord, you'll guide our discussion and guide our study. We love you, God of Israel, and we thank you for this book of Revelation. We thank you for your mercies and your love, O Lord, and we just pray for Israel, your people, Jerusalem, your city, and seal in the resting place of your glory. May you restore your presence there soon. Um, may the hostages be released, and may you have the victory. And we just pray for your people, and we thank you, Father. We pray for all the, those in the world who are suffering, and we just pray that, uh, that Yeshua will return soon to restore shalom to the world. And we ask you to be with us in our study, and may your presence be here, Father, in the merit of Yeshua. Amen v'amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 6, we're going to go to verse 1, and um, I, this one is, is really wild. I mean, this one, we're still in this like heavenly vision, and when we go into this, I think we're going to see some things maybe we haven't seen in the past, maybe you have, maybe everybody's already a scholar on the book of Revelation, but I think the more I study... No, we're not scholars. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. Yeah, well, <laughs> this, I, I think that's the, the best reproach because when you approach the scripture and you think, man, I already know it, then you, you're, you're locked and you can't truly know anything. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, just approaching Revelation like it's a new text is the right way to, to approach this because when we're looking at this, I mean, it is very deep, very incredible, and we hope to utilize the keys of Chazal, utilize the keys of the rabbis to unlock this particular text. So with that, let's, um, let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. It says, I saw that the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with the voice of thunder, come and see. Okay. If you are a Talmudic scholar or a scholar of the Zohar or even a scholar of the Talmud, this phrase, come and see, is significant, all right? So in Hebrew, bo, bo ure'e, come and see, uh, is it's also in the Aramaic, uh, tachazi. So in the Zohar, we have the Zohar here, um, it often says, come and see, come and see. We're going to reveal something very deep. Now, it's interesting because the Jerusalem Talmud says, tachazi, come and see. Whereas the Babylonian Talmud says, Tashma, come and hear. And this is, very a fa this is a fascinating distinction. And to see this in the New Testament, to see this in the book of Revelation, to me is highly significant. Because uh, the Babylonian Talmud, and this is what I understood, and maybe there's some scholars just in the internet world that can correct me and help me understand in a better way. But uh, the Babylonian Talmud, written obviously in Babylon, by the rabbis who were in exile from Israel, from Israel at the time. <coughs> and when you're outside the, the land of Israel, which is called Chutz La'aretz, you're not in touch with the same spirit of prophecy that you are inside the land. Now, the spirit of prophecy, just as we saw it with Jonah, um, Yonah Hanavi, is the spirit will follow, where, the spirit will go wherever it wants to go. But there is a magnitude of, of Kedusha when you enter the land of Israel. So, as I understand it, the Jerusalem Talmud, when it was written, had a certain level of nevua, of prophecy to it. Now, it wasn't like the same level of prophecy as like Micah and Zechariah and Isaiah. It wasn't that same level, but it was like they had a certain measure of this, because it's much closer. Whereas those in Babylon had to use like sheer logic, had to just like rely so much on, you know, just just... I don't know, intelligence and logic to derive the same conclusions that would have been a lot easier for somebody in the land of Israel, but they say, Tashma, come and hear. Now, to me, that's just fascinating. And then to see that the book of Revelation um, uses the word uh, Tachazi, or come and see, just as the Zohar and Jerusalem Talmud does, to me is fascinating. Um, well, 
when you say come and see that thing, a picture is worth a thousand words shows up. When you come in here, you know, when somebody's talking to you about something, hey, have you ever seen such and such? Well, I've heard about it. Yeah, right. Uh, to come and see, no, I actually had experience with it. Yeah, there's something there. So and it's dramatically, it's, an it's a higher level. Understanding. That's right. And so when I'm looking at this, um, the Zohar, when it wants you to say, hey, hey, really come, I'm going to show you a really deep secret. Come and see. Come and see this. Now, I want to tell you what's so fascinating. John 131. You know, John is the Zohar of the Gospels, right? Um, so they, Yeshua tells them, they say, Master, where are, where are you basically, where are you staying? And he tells them, come and see. <coughs> and then Philip tells Nathaniel after they see him, they say, hey, we found Mashiach, we found Yeshua of Nazareth, Mashiach ben Yosef. We found Yeshua ben Yosef. We found him. And then, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And what do they say? <laughs> what do they say? The answer is, come and see. And so that's on this deeper level. And I, I don't know, because John was a mystic, okay? So John is writing on the Zohar level. I don't know if he put that there, you know, because of this deeper level. Hey, let's look into Yeshua on a deeper level. But I, I just find this tachazi, this come and see in Aramaic. And the word chazon, obviously, is linked to the word chazi. Chazon is the word a vision, okay? So uh, when it says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, what does it say? It says Chazon Yeshiau. So I think there's something here. And, can, can I sure, say something? Sure, please. Uh, we were talking about the tree in the garden. Right. And, and in the garden, they were, <clears throat> the Lord wanted them to behold, the Lord wanted them to see the tree and not take from the fruit. They, they, taking from the fruit was taking the power and being equal with God's power. They mm -hmm. wanted the fruit, the power of God for themselves. Mm -hmm. But the Lord had wanted them to behold him mm -hmm. and know him before he revealed the other things to them. The other levels. So so that could also be in the Talmud, I mean in the Talmud, in the Torah, uh, Parshat Re'eh, see, I have set before you a, a, bless, a blessing and a curse. Um, so I I, I find that to be really fascinating, um, especially when the Zohar is on this mystical level that's on this level of the Zohar. It's using this exact language that the Zohar uses. And we're going to discover, by the way, later on, especially in Revelation 21, we're going to, and we'll put the passages right next to each other so you can see it, that Revelation and the Zohar are not only linguistically parallel, but structurally parallel which can only be described or can only be explained through certain ways. One is the revelation borrowed from the Zohar, the Zohar borrowed from revelation, or they borrow from a common source. Um, and Maybe. it's there's so many possibilities there, but it, just looking at it solely from a scholarship point of view, most scholars would say the Zohar is obviously, it quotes the Midrash Rabbah, which is written in the eighth and ninth century, so obviously it was written probably in the year 1300, by uh, Moshe de Leon, Rabbi Moshe de Leon. And then all the tradition of the Masorah, though, that it was written by Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, in the second century, while in the cave hiding from the Romans. I think the stronger answer here is probably that the concepts that are in the Zohar were formulated indeed by Rashbi, but later codified or solidified into the text of the Zohar. Um, so there's always a split the middle yes and yes answer. But when we look at this, I want to tell you, as we look at this first verse, listen to what Dr. Uh, David Stern says, you know, the, the famous Messianic Jew who wrote the commentary, the Jewish New Testament commentary. He says six of the seven seals are broken in this chapter. This, the scroll itself is open when the seventh seal is broken at uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. So when you look at this, if you read Ezekiel 5, we're not going to like read the whole thing, but if you want to, if you go look in Ezekiel chapter 5 and you look at all the judgments that are hitting, you'll see those things, same things kind of re, uh, repeated in, um, in Revelation 6. And so you kind of see this uh, prophetic undergirding of the book of Revelation, especially in chapter 6, is found in uh, Ezekiel and it's also found in Deuteronomy, which we're going to explore later. Okay, Revelation 6, 2. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came forth conquering, and to conquer. 
So what is the biggest mystery of this? I think everybody, in every commentary that I read, we got a mystery. That's who is this guy riding this white horse? And the two options are, is anybody? Antichrist. Antichrist or Messiah, right? So I've seen a lot of commentaries say, yes, this is Messiah, or I haven't seen a lot. I've seen, a, I've seen one, and then I've heard, I've heard other people say, here is the Messiah, because in Revelation chapter 19, you see Yeshua riding a white horse, and he has a crown on his head. Um, there's a problem with that idea. One, notice that in Revelation 19, Yeshua is riding a, a white horse, but he just doesn't have a crown on his head. He's got many crowns on his head, and he's got a sword that comes out of his mouth, not a bow. All right, so anybody that says Revelation chapter 6 refers, to, or, or the, white, the rider on the right horse refers to Yeshua, it's not true, okay? So I heard, and this is going to be kind of crazy, I heard one particular teacher say, a lot of people say that this, Revelation 6 to rider on the white horse is Jesus. And and this guy said, I agree with this. And some people say it's the Antichrist. And so and he said, I also agree with this. And so so everybody's going, You're saying Jesus is the Antichrist. I want you to hear what his position was. Because on the surface of it, it's very offensive. Not the Jesus of the Bible, who is Yeshua. The Jesus of Rome, the statue, this false representation of who, uh, who basically, many, much of the world believes in this statue version of Jesus, not the real Yeshua of the Bible, but this other version. All right, so Paul warns us about another Jesus very seriously. All right, so is it possible that you can have somebody who claims to be Jesus or claims to be the Messiah and is not really holy? All right, has the outward appearance of riding a white, pure horse, but is not very holy. Matter of fact, in Revelation later on, we're going to learn that one of the false prophet, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. So not everything that glitters is gold and not all appearances tell you the full picture. I wish our society understood this principle is just because in our whole print, our whole society, just we just read the headlines. We don't even read the details of the story. We just read the headlines. Okay, fact checker said this was false. It must be false. Well, you didn't look into it. You got to look into it a little bit deeper. I've seen this on scientific studies. I've seen this on medical studies. I've seen this on multiple studies where the headline says one thing, but the data says something different. So in the same way, you have this person riding a white horse the externality looks like he's Jesus. It looks very similar to Revelation chapter 19 and the outward description. But in truth, if you start paying attention to the details, you will see that this person is not Yeshua. Okay? Or a song that could go along with that, not to sound offensive again, but it's just extremely offensive to certain people, possibly Christian soldiers, fighting us to war. Yeah, that's that song. Like if the cross of Jesus going on before. Well, that that type of uh, if you're if you hear that song, you think of the Crusaders. Yeah. And I know many people that yeah. I know a person. I don't know him personally, but it was a big ministry saying we're doing crusades. And I wrote them. I said, Stop don't using that word. Use that word. Stop <laughs> using that word because it's it's. If you know the history there, that's it's terrible. Horrible. It's brutal. It's horrible. And that can he also be considered the Mahdi? Okay, we're going to talk about this because this is legit. So the Mahdi, um, and it is a good point. So, okay, we're going to mention this because that is very, very strong point. And so this is Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, in his text, Derek Hashem, okay, which I think, do we have Derek Hashem here? I'm not sure. Uh, long story, he writes, it was therefore arranged that every good, good concept has its counterpart in evil. This is what scripture means when it says God has made one opposite the other. So this is the position of the realm called one of the greatest rabbis ever, mystical rabbis. So when, when we understand this, that everything holy has a counterpart in evil, that it, it, it's like counterfeit money. If I bring, um, if I bring to you 
monopoly money and I try to buy your car from you, you're going to laugh me out of the shop because like, look, this is monopoly money. You're, don't go past go. This is like, uh, but if I bring some Chinese made counterfeit money, you may take it if you didn't have that little marker to mark across that $100 bill to check to see if it's false. The same way, any lie will have an element of truth, a kernel of truth. And when a lie has a kernel of truth in it, it tricks the, the human spirit to not be able to distinguish and sift very clearly to parse out what is holy and what is not. And you see that in our media today. You see that in the, in the multiple religions today. You see that there is this kernel of truth, but it's wrapped in lie. And this is where I'm going to bring something up. You mentioned the Mahdi. I'm going to, and we're going to talk a lot about the Mahdi and, and various messianic figures in other religions, uh, especially when we start talking about the Antichrist. Um, but has anybody ever heard, I'm going to bring something up from Hinduism. Has anybody ever heard of the Kalki? Yes. Do you have heard of this? Okay. So uh, Hindu, <clears throat> Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh mythology foretells the coming of a figure named Kalki, K-A-L-K-I, who is the 10th incarnation of one of their gods. And he's going to come riding a white horse with a fiery sword. And he's going to put an end to this dark age. And he's going to start a new cycle of time. Okay, what do you think about that? Um, talking about other religions taking kernels of truth. So I want to tell you my personal theory and what this means, okay? Because we are going to talk about Islamic eschatology later on. We're going to talk about um, uh, Jewish eschatology in great detail. We're going to talk about Christian eschatology. Uh, but I want to bring this up because this is very little known because most people in the West don't know a lot about Hinduism, and I don't uh, claim to be an expert in Hinduism in any way, although I have studied it. Um, so this idea of this figure coming on a white horse with a fiery sword to put an end to the world of darkness, I think on some level that this is like a kernel of truth, just like we mentioned this, like the, the human spirit longs to be redeemed. The human spirit is looking for a messianic figure. The human spirit, and also this, this tradition is actually probably pretty late. Uh, so obviously it could have had some type of Christian influence or even Jewish influence on it that kind of infiltrated and became part of uh, a mythology of, of, um, of Hinduism. Hinduism is very old, but this is actually a pretty late tradition. But nevertheless, the fact that this is found in there shows you that there is a large segment. In, in India alone, there's probably 700 million people, maybe 800 million people. And if all of them or some large part of them have this idea, well, if you compound that with this concept of the, the Masi, now the, Masi the, the Messiah in Islam, who was preceded by the Mahdi, and then you have uh, the two Messiahs in Judaism and then the two comings in Christianity. You can like fuse all of these together quite easily if you can skip over some fundamental details. And, um, and you can create a figure that everybody's looking for. And this makes people vulnerable to accepting uh, the false messiah. Uh, ultimately, it does show you that there is this, there is something in, inside the human heart that desires to be redeemed. But, but evil can take a, a real natural holy desire and, and manipulate it for something wrong. Now, could that play into how the the Pope was trying to align all the religions to make one world, make it easier to unify that one? I think so. I think so. So if you could find these points of commonality between multiple religions, you can fuse and create an ecumenical um, <clears throat> world religion or a religion that basically skips over the fundamental details, which you see in some large parts of at least Western Christianity. I don't see a lot of it in Islam. Maybe it's there, but um, where fundamental beliefs, let's say the resurrection of Messiah, Oh, that doesn't have to be literal. You know, a lot of people are taking that position, which is against the Bible. Like, Yeshua is literally resurrected. Like, he's literally resurrected. So if you can, like, take some of these fundamental beliefs and kind of just, like, shuff, shluff them off to the side and focus on major commonalities, then you can probably fuse and unify the world on some level. And when we talk about some of the things that are going to destabilize the world, one thing people are going to be looking for is stability. 
And when you see the things that are coming up, maybe some things we haven't really thought about, and we're going to get into Revelation chapter 6, we're going to just begin that process of, of looking into this, it's pretty pretty shocking, and everybody's going to be looking for someone to solve the problems. So um, we were driving uh we were driving by a big ranch and they had this giant sign on the and it said in trump we trust okay like okay i want to tell you um i am i and i don't i'll just say it okay I'm, I'm not gonna apologize i'll just say it. i am no left winger i am no anti-trump person but you have to be in god we trust you don't trust in man i don't care who they are you don't trust in man but this shows you this hope that people are seeing the, the craziness of the world and saying, somebody has to fix this. Who can fix this? It must be this guy. It must be this guy. I, I, I will, I'll vote for Trump. I'm going to tell you that. But I'm just saying you, you can't trust in anybody other than God. Yeah. yeah. Well, no left the leaders here. also uh, have been in my lifetime have set themselves up to be the answer, to be the solution, to be the defender, to be the helper. I remember in 9-11, um, the problem was there and Bush got on the TV and we're going to fix this and we're going to get these people and we're going to take them out and we're going to make you safe and secure. And I was just, oh, so heartbreaking. It was just like, why aren't you telling the people, let's pray and ask God to help us with this? That's, that's the first step, is that we have to repent and pray and trust only in Hashem, and then obviously make good decisions in voting and stuff. But long story, you can't trust in any, any human person. Okay, you have to trust in, in, in the Lord. And the Bible says this. It says anybody who puts their trust in princes will, will be ultimately disappointed. So with that said, this figure riding a white horse, I want you to hear this. One particular commentator says that, um, the images of the bow and crown in Revelation 6-2 reflect, now this is, a, this is a comment, this is very interesting, reflect the figure of Apollo, who was a god closely associated with the inspiration of pagan prophecy and was well known in Asia Minor, especially in Smyrna and Thyatira. If the allusion to Apollo is included together with other backgrounds, it would heighten the identification of the writer representing the forces of false prophecy and the false messiah. Now, I've never heard of that, I've never seen that, but I thought that that was very interesting that on some level in the pagan world that maybe, I look, I know nothing about this particular pagan god, uh, so-called god, but um, if that is true, this idea of this false messiah is even further strengthened. And when we place that with some of the expectations of the world, um, of the world uh, religions, but also you, you have to bring in the political component is that everyone on planet Earth is looking, hey, we need somebody to fix this because the United Nations is a joke. They've completely failed. Uh, the head of the United Nations, the head of the WHO, uh, they're all just terrible, terrible. Um, they're just terrible organization. They just create problems. They create the problems and say, hey, we're the ones who are going to solve it, uh, which is classic. Um, Yeshua says in Matthew 24, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginnings of sorrows, Matthew 24, 4 through 8 couple of things. One, the word for nation there in the Greek is ethnos. So you do get the idea that there are nation states fighting against each other, but you'll also see there's racial division, okay, in the last days. Uh, all believers should cut through that immediately. Like, it, believers are the solution to all the racial division in America and in the world, because we don't, because a believer in Yeshua is, is the unifying glue of, of humanity because you see it you see Yeshua in every single person I don't care what the color of the skin is with that said um, where are the believers fixing this too but then you also have um, you have forces intentionally trying to divide people and that's part of the prophecy of Daniel 2 which we're going to talk about later not today but in a future uh, study so I want you to think about this 
when he says, beware when people say, I am the Messiah, the white horse, wars and rumors of wars, the red horse, famines, the black horse, pestilences, earthquakes, and sorrows, the pale horse. Uh, I think there may be something to this. And um, with that said, we're about to go into the four horsemen. And the four horsemen just visually give you this really stark image. I've, I've, I think in uh, art, I've painted this like, I painted it once in art class, I think in 98. And then I did like two versions of this in 3D and I was just a very fascinating image. But uh, this image comes from Zechariah. I think, if everybody read this in Zechariah? Zechariah 1 and in 6. So here is 6. It says, I lifted my eyes and, and I saw and behold, four chariots came out between two mountains and the mountains were made out of brass or iron. What does this mean? It means that these were kingdoms, very powerful kingdoms, okay, according to the rabbinic commentary. And the first chariot were red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them powerful. Then I asked the angel who was with me, who are these, my Lord? And the angel answered me, these are the four winds of the sky, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses went out towards the north country, and the white went after them, and the dappled went toward the south country. And the strong went out and sought that they, go, that they might walk back and forth through the earth and said, go around and through the earth. So they walked back and forth through the earth. It's very fascinating. Um, so you have this image of these four chariots going through the whole earth. Some are going this way, some are going this way. And the identity of these is very interesting when you look into the rabbinic commentary on this. So this is our kind of our Remember, our, our, our thought is if you can find the source text in the book of Revelation or anywhere in the New Testament in the Tanakh, then you find the rabbinic commentary on that verse in the Tanakh, and then you retro or you forward apply that um, to the New Testament, you'll unlock some things, all right? So first of all, let's talk about the rider of the white horse. We already talked that he apparently is a false messiah, a political figure who has a bow in his hand. So I was thinking about this, like where's the first time a bow in somebody's hand? Where's the first time this is mentioned? Is that Nimrod? Uh, Nimrod's called a hunter. It is, he's called a hunter. Could be very well linked to Nimrod, for oh, sure. The bow in the sky? The bow in the sky from Noah is the first mention, but that's like God's bow, like he's, yeah. But where is man's bow? So Nimrod is a very good argument. Now, it doesn't, speci doesn't specifically say, I think it just says he's a, a hunter. Obviously, hunting is probably done with a bow. Ishmael uh, was an archer, but are you talking about the specific mention of a bow? Well, no, Ishmael is an archer. I think that that's, that's an important part. So Ishmael is the- Jacob says, I took this land with my sword and my bow. He does say that. He does say that. He says that after, Ishmael, obviously, yeah. he says that in Genesis forty-nine, and the bow and the right. and the, uh, you you look into that statement of Jacob, you'll find that his bow is his prayer. Uh -huh. So the physical bow it does seem to link to Nimrod, and to Ishmael on some level. Um, so listen to this. This is a uh, Craig Keener writing in the IVB Bible Commentary. He says the image of an archer on a white horse might terrify hearers in the Roman Empire. The only mounted archers which who were, with which most were familiar with the, were the Parthians, whose tactics and skills made them Rome's most feared enemies. Old Persian armies, whose heirs were the Parthians were, included sacred white horses. Parthians had defeated the Roman armies in some recent wars. Parthian skill as archers was common knowledge, and other contemporary apocalyptic uh, writers, such as Similitudes of Enoch, also suggested a dreaded Parthian invasion. But even if only based on the bow, ancient hearers would have readily understood this horseman meant conquest and war. So I, I'm not saying that for a fact that this is Islamic in any way, but I think we have to like consider this if, and I just want to tell you, the Rome of today is 100% America to the T, okay? America is the Rome of today. And we're going to explore that later on. Who is like America's most potent enemy? You would say probably China, probably Russia. 
probably Iran, mm -hmm. uh, which had some kind of Persian link here. Mm -hmm. We're going to explore that just a little bit as we go through these four horsemen. And I'm, I'm not claiming to say I know for a fact it's this particular group. I'm not saying that. I'm just thinking that these are just various elements we have to consider uh, when we look into this. Okay, Revelation 6.3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And then some, some manuscripts omit and see, but come and see could be the full verse. Again, this phrase is repeated. The living creatures individually call out to the four horsemen. So what were you saying earlier? I think, what did your... That the four horsemen are associated with the four living creatures. Um... And, and the, the first four seals, and after that there's there's only seems to be four living creatures, so it's only the first four seals, and after that it, it quits a, this association. So that's a fascinating concept, because I haven't really seen that either, that each of the four creatures say, basically say, come, well, when, the, come when Yeshua see. breaks the seal, they say, come and see, and then each one of them seems to be calling out to one of the four horsemen. Horse. So there's like a direct an analogy to yeah. that. And someone asked last week, are these four, are these four uh, creatures linked to the four Gospels? I found a writing from like, I don't know, 280 AD or something, linking the four Gospels to the, to the, to the four creatures. But the, on a certain level, the identity or the nature of these particular horsemen we know that the chayot are the highest level of the angels, but are these particular horsemen, are they demonic? Are they simply symbolic? Are they angelic? Are they, um, like, what are they linked to? And so I think that's something we're, we're going to really look into. And I found this Rashi. Some of the rabbis link the one riding on the, on the red horse to Gabriel, because Gabriel's the angel of judgment. Okay, now we know that the demonic or spiritually or the, the, the spiritual princes over the world are under Hashem's authority. So even though that they're evil, they got to do whatever the boss says, no matter what. All right, so he also can use them as agents of judgment, even though they are not on the right side of things, if that makes sense, if you know about the heavenly authority. Um, so... With that, Rashi says, the heavenly princes of the nations that rule over the four corners of the heavens. If this is true, because, okay, let me just explain this really quick. There are 70 princes over the whole world, 70 angelic princes. So over Persia, there is an angelic prince. Um, and that prince is mentioned in Daniel chapter 10. And an angel is fighting that prince and Michael, after like three weeks of this guy fighting this guy, can you imagine fighting somebody for three weeks straight, 21 days straight? Um, I've gotten in a fight before, like 21 minutes will wear you out. They were fighting for three weeks. And this guy's prayers unlocked like Michael to come and, and help him fight against the Prince of Persia, which is super fascinating. So there is a, there is a heavenly politics, I guess, going on that is that particular princes over certain regions of the world or 70 nations of the world have authority based on what the people are doing. So over Iran right now is probably the exact same prince that, da that Daniel mentions in, ja in Daniel chapter 10. Probably. I have a thought. The 70 princes over the nations correspond to 70 in the Sanhedrin? They do. Mm -hmm. So the Sanhedrin really has spiritual power and authority. Yes. If they were aware of it, to so, use it against these princes. That's right. And and when you make a sacrifice on Sukkot for the 70 bulls, you're making it for all the nations. Mm -hmm. But notice that there's not truly 70 nations. There's 71. Mm -hmm. All right? There's always one plus one. Right. So there's not only 70... 70 in the Sanhedrin, you got the plus one who is Moses, who is ultimately Mashiach, right? And so in the angelic world, you have the 70 princes plus one, which is Metatron, who is the prince of the whole world. So they're under authority. But when, let's say America wants to beat Iran, 
Okay, let's say Iran is an evil play. Let's just rewind it. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Germany. World War II, America's going to fight Germany. America had power over Germany because Germany was evil and America was righteous. If America wants to beat Iran, we know Iran is evil. That's a fact. The people are not. The people are actually wonderful, amazing people. The Persian people are incredible. The government is trash, all right? Um, but if America wants to, wants to truly beat Iran, you have to be righteous first. And when America is not righteous, morally, all of the spiritual armor is thrown off. Okay. Same thing for Israel too. Same thing for any nation in the world. This is just spiritual mechanics. And when, let's say, a, a, a nation like Iran observes certain mitzvot, okay, one of the five pillars of Islam is alms, okay, which is giving charity. That gives a spiritual zikhut, gives a spiritual power, a spiritual army. I mean, spiritual armor. So if there is, let's say you take Rome. Rome is very anti-abortion, okay, generally. Well, it has historically been, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know, maybe just in America. I have no idea, but long story, that gives a spiritual zikhut. If Israel's going to neutralize both Rome, Edom and Ishmael, which is Rome and Mecca, essentially, if you want to neutralize these powers, you have to be more righteous. You can't beat this militarily. You can't beat spiritual forces with physical weapons. Yeah. You have to become holy. So you have to be more dedicated to Hashem. You have to be more dedicated to righteousness. And that will give you spiritual zakhut and have power to the point that at some point you won't have any enemies anymore. Everybody will be at peace. So, okay. So long story, the comment of Rashi seems to imply that these could be these four angelic corners, the heads of these four corners of the earth. Um, so Revelation 6, 4, and there came forth another horse, a red horse, and to him and sat on it was given power to take peace from the earth, and they should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So the color red from, was the color of wars from ancient times. Matter of fact, Esau is called Edom, red, and what was his blessing? He should live by the sword, right? Um, even, the, even the planet Mars in Hebrew Ma'adim means red, okay? And it's always been known historically as the war planet, which I'm not into horoscopes or anything like that, but just historically that's what people have always looked at this like. The rabbis uh, link these four horses to the four kingdoms of Daniel too. Okay, which I think is, is important. So red is Babylon, according to Rashi. Black is Media. White is Persia. And spotted, mixed, is, Edo is, uh, is Edom and slash Ishmael. Now, if you look at this, it's very interesting. The colors, white, red, black, and essentially the word for, for uh, pale is the word chloros, which is green. Okay, like chloroform or chlorophyll, not borophyll, but chlorophyll. Um, so let's look at this really quick. Zechariah 1.8 says, I had a vision in the night. Behold, a man ride, riding a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in a ravine, and behind him were red, brown, and white horses. Um, the word myrtle in Hebrew is hadassim. And the commentary here is that God was going to bring judgment to the whole world, but since he was among the Hadassim, which is linked to Hadassah, which is linked to Esther, which is linked to righteous people, the righteous people on earth mitigated the judgment and basically changed this horse to, to a white horse, essentially, or, or softened its color in a sense. This is the rabbinic commentary. So when you see this red horse come forth to the earth, it means that righteousness ain't there to mitigate it. Red in, in Jewish mystical thought means judgment. Okay, It means absolute Judgment just as sin is red, so is judgment red. And you see this in Isaiah chapter 63. Who is this wearing wearing uh, scarlet garments at his eyes? Tread down the the wine press of uh, Vashem's wrath, and we're going to talk about that later on. Do you, um, did you see or did you post? I saw recently the the flags of the world and all of them that had those four colors in them. That's I have that in my notes. Is that the 
the, those colors make up the Islamic flags. Um, is that a coincidence? Could be, I don't know. Could be, I'm, I'm not really sure, but it's true. The flag of Palestine, which is a country that has never existed, it's not even a country, has never existed. It's always been a regional term from the time of Herodotus. But that flag, red, white, green, black. and black, but that's, it's just not that flag, it's all over. It's all over the Middle East. So, uh, and I'm sure you can find some peace-loving country that has those colors, but I, I think it's something to be noted. And I don't know to what level this is gonna matter, but I wanna tell you what's a fact, is that Edom, which is Rome, and Ishmael, which is Mecca, are gonna play a huge role in what we're gonna be talking about, including these other religions, but these are the major players. There are three major players in the, la in the last days, and that's Jacob, Esau, and Ishmael, these three, all right? So Jacob is the center of the world, Esau is the west, Ishmael is the east, okay? And Ishmael will even encompass, encompass like um, Hinduism and other things, even though that they're not really Hindu, I'm just saying like they're the heads of the east while Christianity is the head of the west, Islam's the head of the east, Judaism is the very center. And did, is there a tie between those three and um, Shem, Ham, and Jacob, Noah's children? The center, the east, and the west? Um, it, you would think that the pattern would match, but the only challenge is that Ham, uh, well, it could be. I need to look into that. Because I was going to say that Ham basically populated uh, I, no, I think I'm actually wrong in this. I need to look into it. Okay. It could be, could be. All right, so uh, let's continue. Listen to this. Um, this is from the Babylonian Talmud, 93a. It says, Rabbi Yochanan says, What does it mean? I saw in the night, behold, a man riding on a red steed uh, stopped between the myrtle trees. Uh, it means that God wanted to change the whole world into night, because it says, I saw in the night. Behold, a man riding refers to God. On the red steed, God wanted to change the whole world into blood. And so, but I don't think it literally refers to God. It means that God, God's agent is about to bring justice to the world. Um, so, a great sword. What do you think of, just when you think of a great sword? To me, when I hear great sword, first of all, this is in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, this phrase. Uh, it's also in Jeremiah 32, 24, and Ezekiel 21, 14, uh, which may be the influence for this. Uh, it's also in Ezekiel, or linked to Ezekiel 14, 21. When I hear this, I think of world war because it's just not a regular sword. We're talking about something great. And why would they say cherev, sword, gadol, or gadola, or whatever it is, something huge, like, what is so big about this? To me, that reminds me of World War. So I want you to hear this from Lev Eliyahu. And I could be wrong in my interpretation, by the way. I'm just thinking that this refers to something massive. So this is Lev Eliyahu. Um, and this is a somewhat of a modern rabbi commenting. And he says, I heard in London from the holy rabbi Elchanan Wasserman, quoting the Chofetz Chaim, that our rabbis say that the world, Gog and Magog, will be threefold. After the First World War, the Chofetz Chaim said that that was the first battle of Gog and Magog, and that in about 25 years' time, a second world war would occur that would make the first one seem insignificant. Then there will be a third battle. Rabbi Elchanan concluded that one must suffer the pains of Mashiach. However, the wise man will quietly prepare himself during that time and perhaps he will merit to see the comforting of Sion and Yerushalayim. All right, so it's interesting to know that World War I and II are seen as, a, as part of Gog and Magog. So uh, Gog and Magog, the gematria of Gog and Magog is 70. All right, so Gog and Magog traditionally in, in Jewish thought begins on Sukkot. So during the time that, that Israel's making sacrifices for all 70 nations to the 70 bulls over the course of Sukkot, Gog and Magog attacks during that time. And this is, this is a microcosm of what happened to Yeshua 
in that he was praying for those, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do, while he was being attacked. So you scale out from Mashiach to, the, to Israel and the nations, Israel's praying for the nations while the nations are attacking Israel. Because what the, the gematria of Yitzchak, of Isaac, is 156. The gematria of Zion is 156. The rabbis say in Midras Tankuma, whatever happened to Joseph happened to Zion. Whatever happened to Zion happened to Joseph. That tells you whatever happens to Messiah, son of Joseph, happens to Israel, and vice versa, because Mashiach ben Yosef is a microcosm of Israel. So when you see the Jewish people suffering in the world today, you are seeing the suffering of Messiah. Because what you are, and, and, and that scales out even because when you see people in the world suffering, their Messiah takes that suffering as well. But it happens in a concentric circle. Messiah, Israel, world. That's the, that's the pattern, that's the, that's the flow. So when you see what happened on October 7th, you are seeing a, a larger, not a, I don't know if it's a larger scale, but like a, like a, um, a, a, huge, a huge scale of Israel suffering that is linked to Messiah suffering. Same thing with the Holocaust and everything. So um, with that said, uh, that tells you also that whatever happens to Messiah's son of David will happen to Israel as well. So the suffering of Israel that they're experiencing now, that will be elevated over all the world. Okay, so Revelation 6, 5. What time is it right now? 7.30, okay. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a balance on, on his hand. Uh, a, a judgment scales. He had scales in his hand, which in Hebrew is called Mosnayim. Um, this apparently is linked to economic instability, inflation, and disaster. Um, and we'll explain in the next verse, Revelation 6, 6. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. I never understood this passage until COVID broke out. And I was waiting in the parking lot of... Uh, Walmart for them to bring out products that we couldn't go into Walmart or there was all these people lined up and it was insanity it was like we were living in a twilight zone type of a show and I kept thinking man there were videos online of people literally punching each other for rolls of toilet paper and I want you to think about this I want you to really hear what this is saying First of all, when it says a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine, listen to this from 2 Kings 7, 1. And Elisha replied, hear the word of God. Thus says God, this time tomorrow, a saya of choice flour shall sell for a shekel at the gate of Samaria and two sayas of barley for a shekel. So you see that in that particular passage, if I remember it correctly, God proclaims, here's what's going to happen to the economy. He goes, there's no way that's, that this was during the time of a famine that something's going to sell for a, a single shekel. And then they find this massive hoard of all this, like, supplies, and it drove down the demand so much that it was just like, okay, it's free. Just give me, offer whatever you want. So in the inverse is happening in Revelation 6. It says, a quart of wheat for a denarius and a quart of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and wine. We're going to explain this. First of all, the, the concept of scales tells you there's something really bad economically happening, and that's in Leviticus 26, 26. It says, when I break your staff of bread, ten women shall break your bread in a single oven, and they shall dole out your, wed, your bread by weight, and though you eat, you shall not be satisfied. The fact that it's something's been doled out, okay, let me put it on the, weight, on the scale, okay, you get this little piece, that is a curse from the Torah. It's a curse that bread has to be weighed out in, in a scale. That tells you there's not enough bread. That tells you that there is a scarcity. That tells you that there is a massive demand on basic staples while on the superfluous luxury items there's not a demand. So in the same way, um, 
you know, if, if I was really smart, I'd be hawking like toilet, I'd be like opening my jacket on the street. And it's like, I got rolls of toilet paper. I got this on this side. I got, uh, you know, just basically, um, you know, I could have made a lot of money back then. So because it was in such high demand, so I want you to think about this. When it tells you um, uh, wheat and and a quart of wheat for a denarius and a three quarts of barley. Barley is food for an animal, right? Wheat is food for a human. So a denarius is a basically what a person would make in a day. And this is reported in, um, it's reported in, a, in, an, in an ancient text that basically says that, that one of the commanders of a particular ancient army would give a conix or a quart of wheat to each of his soldiers on a daily basis. So to feed somebody's family, they would have to buy barley. If he had multiple kids, he would have to buy barley. So don't just think that this applies to bread. Think of it like this. Wheat and barley represent every single basic staple of living necessity while oil and wine represent the superfluous things like electronics or like a PlayStation 5 or, or something that is just like an Xbox, something that you don't really need to live on, those prices won't be inflated. But the basic uh, staples will be heavily inflated. Matter of fact, multiple commentaries here um, say the famine was created by a high inflation rate. This wheat cost between 5 and 15 times the average price of wheat. But why does it say, but do not harm the oil and wine? But um, one, com one commentator here said is basically, hey, don't, don't affect their prices. So oh, okay. don't touch their prices. Meaning oil and wine, the price will still be the same. And this is even worse. Let me tell you why. Because you have to spend every dime you have on the basic necessities. Mm -hmm. While what we used to afford is like within our reach, but we can't reach it. You see, like, man. Unless you want to starve for a day. Yeah, unless you want to no starve for a day. Starve. That's right. So what does that tell us prophetically? It tells us that there is going to be a massive shock to our economic system. We've already experienced on some level Biden inflation and different things like that. And they just reckless spending. The United States is 100, 100, 100 plus, 150 plus trillion dollars in debt. Uh, I know that's not what our actual bottom line says, but if you look at unfunded liabilities on usdebtclock.org, you'll see it. So those are basically checks just waiting to be cashed that nobody's got money for. Um, and there is something huge coming to our financial system that is going to collapse it. And this is all proceeding. This is like the beginning of birth pains. We haven't getting into the bad stuff yet. So you hit this, all right? I'm telling you that right now we're looking for a savior to fix America, to save America. Wait till this hits, okay? We'll be signing up for anybody, God forbid. So I'm, I'm telling you, when you see this on a worldwide scale, it's going to be far worse than, than we ever realized. And there is a way to mitigate it. Um, yeah. Vote. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, vote. vote. Yeah, that's certainly uh, a... Vote certainly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or, yeah. or just don't vote for certain people. Okay, so listen to this. Sanhedrin 97a. Listen to what the Talmud says. The sages taught in a baraita with regard to the seven-year period, the sabbatical cycle during which the Messiah, the son of David, comes, meaning the rabbis believe in a seven-year tribulation. Okay? I have, I have friends that, that thought that, that Tim LaHaye invented that idea. That idea is not invented. That idea is fundamental to Judaism. It comes from Daniel. It comes from uh, other places, but it's clearly in the Talmud. During the first year, this verse will be fulfilled, and I will cause it to rain upon one city and cause it not to rain upon another city. Amos 4, 7. The word for rain, I don't know, I haven't checked the Hebrew of this particular passage, but rain in Hebrew, Gashem, just in general, it could be a different word, could be Yore or, or Makush, but I'm not sure what it says here, but rain in general means financial blessing. Because if your rain didn't come on your crop, your crop is dead, and it's like it's bad. So what this means is that the economic, the first year there will be economic shock, shocks in some sectors of society, while other sectors do really well, some do really bad, okay? And I actually think we saw that in 2020. 
Uh, I'm not saying that 2020 is the beginning, although I have some friends that think it, it is, but I'm not saying that. Was that the beginning of the sabbatical year? Is it a, a seven years? No, I think the beginning of the sabbatical was in 2021. Well, me too. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, somebody online can correct me. The actual uh, Shemitah cycle. I'm not exact. I think it's 2021, but I can't remember. All right. So during the second year of that period, arrows of famine will be shot, indicating there will be famine only in certain places. During the third year, there'll be a great famine of men, women, children, the pious, men of action will die, and the Torah is forgotten by those who study it. So that'll be in the third year. Interestingly, I saw in a, in a, in a text, and I think it's called Pirkei Mashiach, in that book that I showed at the very beginning, Jewish Apocalypse, uh, uh, Trajectories in Jewish Apocalyptic, they say that, the, and it, the way I read it was the first three years of this seven year period that there would be a pestilence that would last for three years. And I was reading, I was going, rut row, <laughs> like, like Scooby-Doo would say. Um, and then it said, in the third year, they will apostatize from Hashem. And I'm just sitting there going, pestilence lasting three years. I'm just going, okay. I'm not saying that's where we're at. I'm just saying that sounded a little uh, too close. All right, so. Well, they're saying that we're gonna have a new pestilence. That's right. That is true. The, and, all the higher-ups are saying that. I'm just going to tell you scientifically, uh, we got a problem. <clears throat> and we'll talk more about this later on, but uh, 10 years before COVID came out, I, I read science magazines all the time. And every single one of them said it's, it's not a matter of if, but when. Every 100 years, there is always something that busts out like this. Like every, it's just, just science. The problem is, though, is that we have invented gain of function research. Yep. Gain of function research is basically taking an existing virus and hot wiring it. So it's not creating a virus from scratch, but you're taking an existing virus and then hot wiring it to have, you know, like a, an ACE2 receptor that perfectly links into the ACE2 cell and the epithelium of the nasal and uh, going down to the, uh, down the, uh, the uh, what is it the trachea and everything else and the, into the lungs you're going and they're doing stuff like COVID as well as like across the board including people all the way up to 80 it was like one percent or something for it, it stratified based on age they're messing around with stuff like MERS that has like 40 percent death rate and other things like that you're going why are we doing this we should drop a bomb on any of these uh, maybe i shouldn't say that um <laughs> we should shut down any of these uh any of these labs that are doing this because it represents a threat to all the world okay i didn't mean that sent to the sensors online i did not mean that okay um, um all right so not literally, not literally. it was symbolic uh okay wink <laughs> all right so all right, during the fourth year, there will be plenty, but not great plenty. So what I'm reading this is that after this economic shock wave, the, the, the economy starts to like self-stabilize, and this is the rabbinic view. So there will be great, there will be plenty, but not great plenty. In the fifth year, there'll be great plenty, and they will eat, drink, and rejoice, and the Torah will return to those who study it. Because there's an idea, ain kamach, ain Torah, that when there is no flower, there is no Torah, meaning when People are struggling to just basically make ends meet and just eat. They don't have a lot of time for a Torah study. So um, long story, what the rabbis are describing is this massive shockwave hits the economic world, but then um, the system kind of self, self checks or self uh, stabilizes. Well, it, it seems like it would take two years for that to even happen if the pipeline is drained and you don't just fill that again uh, for you know for crops to grow you've got to plant the crop you've got a whole year to grow that right and then it just dribbles into the system of the and then by the end of the second year yeah you would have something by that time yeah so economically there's the forces there's always it what goes up must come down uh what you know if you stretch a rubber band this way it goes the other way so economics it, there's there's checks and things that, that happen economically and you see that in the rabbinic text which is quite amazing because it's written about at least I don't know 1500 uh, 1600 years ago okay uh, during the sixth year heavenly voices will be heard the word is kolot I guess you could translate that also as rumors but um, I've seen some suggest that 
but uh, the word is voices. Heavenly voices? Heavenly voices. Um, let me see, is that how it reads? Uh, let me see. During the sixth year, heavenly voices will be heard. During the sabbatical year, the seventh year, wars, uh, for example, the war of Gog and Magog will be, war, will be waged involving the Jewish people. During the year after the conclusion of the Shabbat, of the sabbatical year, the seventh year, the son of David will come. Meaning the son of David comes at the end of the seventh year, the beginning of the eighth. Okay. Rav Yosef says, haven't there been many several sabbatical cycles during which events transpired in that manner? And nevertheless, Messiah didn't come. There's been earthquakes. There's been this. There's been that. We've heard that argument all the time. And listen to what the rabbis say. Have the phenomenon during the sixth year heavenly voices and during the seventh year wars transpired? Moreover, have all these phenomena transpired in the order in which they were listed? So you have to li you have to follow the orders. What the rabbis are saying? Yeah, there's been there's going to be earthquakes, tornadoes, different things happen. Yeah, but does it follow in this order over a period of seven years? And so that order apparently is very important for the Jewish uh, people. So, um, moreover, in Amos chapter 8, speaking of famine, we're talking about economic and, and physical famine. Listen to this. Um, Amos chapter 8, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, while I'll send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, and they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Um, so I don't think that precludes a physical famine, but I think that probably precedes the, uh, an idea or maybe even uh, follows uh, a physical famine to the point that we're going to be looking for truth and cannot find it. Looking for the word of God, but can't find it. Okay. Listen to this. This is Judd Gregg, who said this back in the Bush administration. He was the Senate Budget Committee. He was a Republican of New Hampshire. He says, except for a terrorist getting its hands on a nuclear weapon and exploding it somewhere in the United States, debt is the biggest issue we have. We are facing a financial catastrophe of inordinate proportions because we have, our, have on the books obligations which exceed the net worth of the American public. We are essentially bankrupt as a country, even though, even though we don't want to admit it. In Deuteronomy 28, it says, if you follow Hashem's word, you will lend and you will not borrow. Okay? America is the biggest borrower on planet Earth. And um, that tells you that we're not following God's word. It's not rocket science, obviously. But um, Alan Greenspan is reported to have said this. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. If there were, the government would have to make its holding illegal, as was done in the case of gold. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for owners to protect themselves. This is the shabby secret of the welfare state is tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It is a stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, then uh, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism towards the gold standard. We're going to talk about this further uh, with the move towards digital currency, specifically Bitcoin, and maybe not even Bitcoin, maybe something else. But the biggest argument that everybody, for instance, I don't know if you saw this recent thing where this lady apparently is spending a lot of uh, government money on her, uh, on her boyfriend to take trips and different things. And they say, well, where is all this money coming from? She goes, well, I just have hoards of cash. Uh, and so the, the government hates cash because you can't trace cash. Um, hoards of cash, yeah, stuffed under the bed. Okay, Revelation 6, 8, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, in Revelation 13. Revelation 6, 8. Behold, a pale horse, and he who sat on it was named Death. Sheol followed him. Authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine, with death, and by wild animals on the earth was given to him. If this applies in our generation, that's there are 8 billion people essentially on the planet. That's 2 billion people dying. You introduce an economic stability with that many people passing away, through these four levels of different things happening, you're destabilizing the entire planet, economic system, national, socio-political. You're throwing everything up in the air 
and what we're saying, how people are just looking for a savior of America. You're talking about this is going to set the stage for someone very charismatic to say, I'll fix the problem. I have the solution. And if they actually do probably have the solution, then everybody's going to say, who can wage war against this person? This person's amazing. This person must be some kind of God. But also, the, um, the WEF, they've stated their goal is to reduce the Earth's population by one half at least. So there's a lot of shady things that, are, that many people in, like, I have, I have the book, The COVID-19 Great Reset, and you see some other things that, that they're projecting could be happening or their views and visions of the world. It's scary. It is totally dystopian. It's Klaus Schwab, yeah. So um, Revelation 6, 8. So when we talk about this, the word for pale horse, and I mentioned this earlier, the word pale is chloros. Um, you could even use, like, when you say green grass in Greek, you could say the word green is chloros. Well, if we get chloroform or chlorophyll or whatever, uh, not chloroform, it could be related. Chlorophyll, chloroform, I think you put on the, it yeah. makes people pass out. Right. At least in the movies it does. Um, listen to this, this is Rabbi Lichtenstein. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein commenting in his commentary on the New Testament. He says, greenness is the sign of death. Death causes the face to turn green, as it says in the Talmud, referring to the angel of death, that they throw into the mouth of the dying the drop which caused his death and his skin and his face become green. Avoda Zara 26b. Um, my friend Tovia suggests that this is like a negative counterpart to the heavenly colors. So there are heavenly colors that are symbolic. These are not literal. But the Zohar says the expanse of heaven above the lower paradise displays four colors, white, red, green, and black corresponding to the four doors on its four sides. So there's something heavenly with these four colors. Um, <clears throat> but this seems to be a negative level of that, the opposite. Um, and then I want you to notice, th I want you to, to see this. It says, with famine, death, or no, sword, famine, death, and wild animals. Fourfold. So it also gives you this idea that death is following these other three because that's the natural conclusion or result. And then hell follows, or Sheol follows him, the grave, which is the natural result of death. So it's hard to tell whether these four horsemen are like all unleashed at the end times, or these released, unleashed throughout history, or are they unleashed all at the same time? Uh, it doesn't seem like they're at the same time. It seems sequential in my view. That first you have this political power, Secondly, you have this war. Third, for the war creates economic collapse, and that economic collapse creates disease and pestilence. That's what it seems like that in my mind, but you can read it in different ways. But listen to this in Deuteronomy. It says one of the curses is that waste and famine, wasting famine, ravaging plague, deadly pestilence, and fang beasts will, will I loose against them with venomous creepers and dust. The sword shall deal shall deal death without and as terror within to youth and maiden and like the suckling as well as the age. Deuteronomy 32, 24. So listen what the Ibn Ezra, who is a, a medieval rabbi, says, says about this. It says, it appears to me that scripture mentions the four evil punishments. They are starvation, which is what the wasting hunger refers to, and devouring of the fiery bolt, and the bitter destruction refers to the plague, and the teeth of the beast I will send upon them refers to the beast. And finally, there is the sword, as it is says, without shall the sword be reeved. Um, Bahaye, Rabbeinu Bahaye says, Moses speaks of four different judgments, afflictions can, which can be, uh, can be summarized as famine, pestilence, wild beast, and death by the sword. Those four apparently are linked to the four horsemen which are summoned by the four creatures, which link to the four corners of the earth, which link to all kinds of levels of four, 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 four throughout the, the, throughout the text. Okay, Revelation 6, 9. And when I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those, those who have been killed for the word of God and the testimony of the lamb which they had. So under the altar, 
Okay, first of all, do you see that these souls have been killed and that they are conscious after death? So this really destroys the idea of that the soul is not conscious after death. It's clearly they're, they have died, they have been beheaded, or they've been killed for the word of God, to beheaded maybe later, and yet they're conscious saying, God Matai, how long? Well, so there's time, too. There is time. So this is there weird. There seems to be a consciousness of time. There is, there is some level of time in heaven. Now, is time flowing the same way we experience it on earth? Probably not. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but there is a flow of time, and you'll see that later on in the book of Revelation when it says in about half an hour passed. Yeah. If a day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day, a half an hour is like 45 years or something. I don't, I don't know exactly you know, what, the, what the relationship is, but time is relative. But... Why does it say the soul's under the altar? So where does it say the soul resides? In Leviticus. Leviticus, the, the life is in the, the blood. blood, right? And so in the sacrifices, you were to pour, you put blood on the four, horner, the four horns of the altar and, and put the base, at the base of the altar, you to pour the blood in, in certain sacrifices. This is very interesting because you have the souls under the altar in heaven. All right, so... Um, and that's very interesting because in the Talmud, it says that there are, and we mentioned this, there are seven level, levels of heaven, and the fourth level of heaven is the altar, and upon the altar, the archangel Michael offers up the souls of the righteous as sacrifices. And, and this, the souls are not dying, they're ascending up into higher levels of heaven. Okay? So um, you see in a sacrifice that you bring the animal to the to the altar you slit the throat take the blood you put it on the four corners or pour it on the base or you do what you're supposed to do with that and then you burn it and in that process of burning the physical transforms to spiritual and ascends upward and we read about how the four uh, about how the different animals if it's an ox it, it it's it's kill it it fuses into the heavenly throne of the ox if it's a, a dove it fuses into the heavenly throne the aspect of the eagle if it's uh, the lion, the fire comes down like uh, in the shape of a lion, consumes the sacrifice. And the human is really the ultimate purpose of this is that they would give their lives as a sacrifice, not physically, not through death, but as a living sacrifice. And in doing so, ascend up and fuse into the heavenly man of the altar. So, which links to Yeshua saying, he, he who overcomes will sit with me on my father, uh, sit with me on my throne just as I sat with my father on his throne. Okay. So, Rabbi Eliezer taught, and this is in Shabbat 152b, the souls of the righteous are hidden under the throne of glory, as it says, yet the soul of the Lord shall be bound up in the bundle of life. Rabbi Anan, Ketubot 111a, uh, uh, says, whoever is buried in the land of Israel is deemed buried under the altar, since the, in respect of the latter it is written in Scripture, the altar of earth you shall make unto me. With respect to the, respect to the former, it is written, and... His land does make expiation, atonement for his people. Um, this is in uh, Avot the Rebbe Natan. It says, The Holy One, blessed be he, took the soul of Moses and stored it under the throne of glory. Not only the soul of, Mo soul of Moses is stored under the throne of glory, but the souls of the righteous are, already, are stored there. In Pasitha Rabati 36, I believe, it says, The soul of the Messiah is stored under the altar. And so we have in Jewish tradition, the souls of the righteous are stored under the heavenly throne. And then you have in Jewish literature, the souls are, are, are stored under the heavenly throne. And then you have in the book of Revelation, they're stored under the altar. Um, and, but you do have in, in Jewish tradition that the, and this is in Haggigah 12b, the great prince Michael stands and offers up on the, on the heavenly altar the souls of the righteous. Okay. So listen to this. Um, this is a commentary from Strike and Billerbeck. It says the souls of the martyrs are in the most in immediate nearness to God. Their mechitza, their boundaries, uh, the, surrounds the throne of God in a circle. Inside, even nearer to God's throne uh, than they are, no one dwells. Rabbinic literature never mentions the site of the heavenly altar as the abode of departed, departed souls, though it does mention the place under God's throne frequently, but it does mention that their souls are offered on the altar. It does mention that. It is 
once mentioned hypothetically that being buried under the altar in Jerusalem is tantamount to being buried under the throne of glory, which we just mentioned. Now listen to this. Um, uh, almost there, kind of, uh, bear with me just a second. Uh, where it talks about the word of God and the testimony of the Lamb. I was reading in a rabbinic commentary from Rabbi Nachman, and it says the Torah is called the testimony. And it made a huge point of this about how the Torah is called the testimony. It was very interesting because they were killed for the word of God and the testimony of the Lamb. And that's what I was going to say, is that the fact that the souls of the righteous are mentioned in connection with the altar gives you this idea that they died as a sacrifice. It gives you this idea that they gave their lives up, al the Hashem, for the sanctification of, his, of God's name as a martyr. And so the fact that it's linked to the altar gives you this idea that they gave their lives up um, as a heavenly, as a, as a sacrifice, um, which is equivalent and parallel to the 10 martyrs of Yom Kippur. Which, if you know, the ten martyrs of Yom Kippur, in in the, it's actually in Tisha B'av as well. In the liturgy, there's uh, there's a a, a piot a, a prayer called Arze Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, and it mentions the ten sages who gave their lives for Hashem's name, and it's also written in uh, Asrei uh, Haruge Amachut. It's the ten martyrs of the kingdom, like Rebbe Akiva, Rabbi. Uh, Ishmael Akon Gadol and different ones that were all killed during the Second Temple era. These, there were these ten sages who died, and the reason why they died is to make an atonement for the ten brothers who sold Joseph. And the rabbis say, why did God wait to the Second Temple era to exact punishment upon these ten righteous sages in, in place of the ten brothers who sold Joseph? The answer is because something happened in the Second Temple era that reminded Hashem of the sale of Joseph which I think it's obvious what that is. Um, okay. Um, Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Admatai, how long, Master, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Um, so this phrase, Admatai, how long? Even I was praying in the prayers, like after the Amidah, and it says, and for you, O Lord, how long? This how long, how long is repeated in the Tanakh, Psalm 6 4, Psalm 13 2, Psalm 74 10, Psalm 79 5, Psalm 90 13, Psalm 94 13, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. It's like numerous throughout there. So you have a Hebrew prayer being prayed, and it's Admatai. And this is a common prayer when somebody is suffering and they're seeing the unrighteous prevailing while the righteous people are suffering. And apparently it's an okay prayer to pray to Hashem, Ad Matai, how long? To me it's kind of like, you know, it's like one of those prayers like, I don't know, it's there. I'll just say that. It's in, our, it's in the heart to, to cry out to the Lord, how yeah. long? But then you don't realize the effect of your prayer, the consequence of it, what, what's going to be unleashed. That's right. You pray it. Uh, it almost seems a little disrespectful to pray it that way, but then again, it's the cry of the heart. Yeah. And, you know, but I is, think... Isn't it like, though, you're you're calling on the, the, the coming of Mashiach, though? Yeah, yeah. No, it, that's, it, I guess you're praying it with the right intent, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and apparently it's okay to pray that, you know, so... You know, if you're suffering or struggling, Admatai is okay prayer, or okay prayer to pray, even though there's some prayers I'm like, man. And, but at the same time, it says, give him no rest. Mm -hmm. Give him no rest until Jerusalem is at Very peace. Nice. Give him no rest. And so Yeshua even teaches to be like that uh, really annoying neighbor who keeps knocking on the door in the middle of the night saying, can you give me some bread? The Lord wants to hear from us. Yeah. And that's amazing. Like prayer that he was praying to unlock yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that prayer. So that's something that I think is very important that you bring that up, Corey, is that prayers, um, and we don't really realize this, and, I, and I'm probably going to misstate it or not fully capture the power of prayer, but when you pray, it's almost as if you are giving permission, in a sense, for Hashem to work in your life. 
because you have a certain um, you have a certain authority over your own life or whatever, and Hashem's not going to override your will to a certain he's point. A he's a gentleman. He's not going to like on a certain level, God like cuts it off. Like no one's a truly a free agent, but at the same time, Hashem has set up the universe where we have choice. So free will is 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 given, uh, choice is given, and yet everything is foreseen. I I so, guess I've always saw it as you know when in in, that, in the garden when. Um, God would walk with Adam and Eve. That was that is the time of prayer. I mean, that really is like that's what that's how we reconnect to that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Is when, yeah. when God walked with Adam and Eve. No, I, I think that's important. And so you're inviting His presence to be in your life. So if you don't invite Him, and it's like He's you know, so on some level when you pray, I mean, there are things like Daniel, as you said, Daniel was was praying, and it'll lock that angel to to. To go help that other guy fight, uh, help the other angel fight uh, the Prince of Persia. That if America and Israel, and you know, say for Israel also, if Israel truly wants to win, the right strategy is first of all from the top down to say, guys, let's all put on sackcloth and ashes right now and repent before Hashem. Mm -hmm. Number one, we pray that. Number two, we start telling the truth. The Temple Mount belongs to the Jewish people. We're taking it back. We're not going to, and everyone's going to go crazy, but. You know what? We just have to stand on truth. We have to follow the word. We just stand on truth. And but it starts with repentance. Repentance, prayer, mm -hmm. tzedakah, tefillah, teshuva. These three things, uh, uh, which is charity and righteousness, uh, prayer and repentance. Okay. So listen to this from. This is First uh, Enoch forty-seven. Okay, we're going to bring in Enoch later. Uh, I think we're going to mention we were talking earlier melanie and i were talking about ufos <laughs> we're going to bring this in we're going to talk about ufos later not in this chapter okay you'll have to watch okay there's the, i think there's going to be something to that okay in these days i know that sounds weird but just wait there's something here there's something there i'll come with the evidence that sounds wild right now i sound like that guy with the big hair it's alien it's not alien okay in these days the holy ones will dwell in the heavens uh, who dwell in the heavens above will intercede in agreement because of the blood of the righteous and because of the prayer of the righteous that it may not be futile before the Lord of the spirits that the judgment for them be carried out and they may not be delayed for them forever in those days I saw how the ancient one sat on his throne of glory and the books of the living were opened before him and the hearts of the holy ones were filled with joy because of the number of righteous drew near and the prayer of the righteous was heard and the blood of the righteous was avenged before the Lord of spirits from the opening of the books and the conclusion here is directly drawn that it is the hour of vengeance first Enoch 47 this they're saying how long, Admatai, avenge our blood, what does that make you think of? What is the first reference to this in the, in the book of Genesis? Uh, um, Cain. Cain and Abel, Cain that's Abel. right. So Abel's blood cries okay. to the ground. Now if you look at the Hebrew there, it says his damin, his bloods, mm -hmm. plural. And the rabbis look and say, why does it say bloods plural and just not blood singular, dam? Why does it say bloods, damin? And the answer is, he who kills one person kills the entire world, and he who saves one person saves the entire world. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think about this. How many people have been aborted in America? Man. 60 million. 60 million. So that blood is crying out. Um, well, unfortunately, with Israel, um, I don't know if it's changed now. No abortion is prevalent in Israel. Yeah, the it's army, true. They have a Cohen army, so they. It's true. The army would fund the first three abortions for their girls. So. Uh, they, the Jews killed more Jews in the Holocaust than the thought about killing. Oh, Rachemna. So, um, with that said, Israel has to stop that. You know, like that has to be stopped. And and. This was like. 25 or 30 years ago. So at that same time, though, if you really think about how many people, just just mathematically, how strong Israel would be if that didn't happen. You know, that would be just, just, just don't even, just take all morality out, just look at simple numbers. Um, 
it would just be shocking. Um, so that has to stop. Yeah. Um, with that said, I mean, that is, it, it pollutes the earth. So blood spilled cries out to Hashem and then asks for judgment. But Hashem is so merciful that it, it has to reach a certain number before the trigger is hit. Why is that? The answer is this, because if Hashem wanted, uh, he is so righteous and so holy that even the smallest imp inappropriate thought is worth destroying the entire planet over, okay? Because he is so holy, his holiness is so high. But his mercy is so high also that it mitigates that. So what happens is that it has to reach a certain point, and, and you see this with the Canaanites, the seven nations that had to be totally wiped off the planet Earth and the land of Israel because they, had, they were so wicked, they were doing some things that were so unspeakable, things like Hamas does, okay? And even worse. Even worse. Well, I, I think they were right there. I don't know. I can't imagine anything worse than what Hamas did. But <coughs> maybe the scale was bigger. Um, but what Hamas did, I mean, on some level, I can't even imagine the Nazis being that bad. I mean, I know that they were that bad, but this, I, I, it's, it's unspeakable. It's unthinkable. It's, it's like, how do you even put that in your, in your mind to even process that? I can't. So... So, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, that's right. Even the animals themselves were, in the days of Noah, the animals were. So we're going to talk a lot about the days of Noah as well in future chapters. So, okay, Revelation 6, 11. A long robe was given to each of them, and they were told that they should rest for yet a while until their fellow servants and their brothers who would also be killed even as they were should complete their course. So it does seem that on some level God, Hashem is asking, he's just waiting, he's just hoping for people to repent and he's sending people to, to preach the gospel, to preach the Torah, to preach you know, morality to the world. And when people have had that opportunity and then reject it, then at some point Hashem has to say, okay, that's enough. Well, and we know that Hashem said to Abraham that... Um, he was giving the people in Canaan 400 years because your people are going to go away for 400 years right? and then give them 400 years to repent because their wickedness was not complete. Right, so there has to be a certain level that triggers the judgment, but that gives them opportunity to change just as it was in the days of, of Yonah Hanavi. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that, and this might be a weird question, but you know, the righteous people on the earth prevents the, the, the judgment of God. So the, as the remnant, the, 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 the righteous get smaller because of... Um, I know that for a fact. So then the judgment of God comes because of that? The, I know that for a fact. So the rabbis say, uh, and it's based on um, the laws of, of Negaim, which is uh, leprosy. Either the, when Messiah comes, either the entire world's going to be completely wicked or it's going to be completely righteous. And you're going, how on earth is that going to be? I mean, what's going to happen to the righteous during this time? Well, and, you just said yeah. that during that time, it, the word is not there That's and right. people fall away. That's right. So, and, and we're going to look into this further even when the rabbis say, even the holiest place, the Beit Midrash, which is the house of study, will be turned into a brothel. We'll, and you're kind of seeing some of that even today on certain level, but we're all shocked by it right now. Ten years from now or five years from now, ah, it's going to be common. Um, things that we were shocked ten years ago about, society's already moved way beyond that. The goalpost has completely moved. If you told me in 2015 certain things that were... Uh, were talked about what would be happening like I wouldn't I still wouldn't have believed it even though I knew where that's where it was going I still wouldn't believe it the things that we're talking about today so if five years from now you're gonna see it you're gonna hear I can't even say the things that will that are gonna come out because we get banned off of YouTube or something um, when I see them talking about a they give a white robe told to wait just a little bit until the full number should be reached yeah knowing a little bit about the martyr situation going on in the world. There's more martyrs, people being martyred for their faith today than ever in history. Mm -hmm. You know, that's and stunning. So 
I mean, you wouldn't think that now. The slavery is worse today than it had ever been oh, in yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. But the but the people being killed for their faith in different countries more than ever before in history. So when I'm reading this, and there's a number that has to be hit. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. There's a number that has to be hit. You know what I? The full number has to be reached. I I think. Is there a number? Yeah, I well, think God it's this. It's all about numbers. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm saying okay. If there's a number that has to be reached, there's more, and it's increasing mm -hmm. and compounding now. Um, we're speeding toward this number. Yeah, and I think that number. It, it basically it, the 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 balancing point is this, and this is just my opinion, is that when children are raised in a way. They have no opportunity to repent. That's when it flips. So, for instance, if somebody's an adult and they make a decision on their own lives and it's a bad decision, they still have the capacity to make that decision. When somebody's five years old, they don't have the capacity to make that decision, and that happens across the board. Um, it's, that, it's at that point Hashem says, they've taken away their opportunity to, to choose. I have to take away their opportunity to choose. So, because at that moment, you're just raising people who are just destined to, be, to go to Gehenom. Yeah. So you have to cut it off at that moment. So it's when the children are, getting, are, are, are involved, it's at that moment. This is just my view, and I see this with uh, Noah, and I see this just based on the patterns of history, that when children um, have no opportunity to truly make a decision for the Lord at that moment, that's when it's cut. And, and that's merciful because yeah, that if merciful. if you just yeah. allow people to just unchecked, just continue to, to just fall into gay home, that's that's where that's that's not just. So that's just my view. Um, okay, um, I'm looking here. Okay, listen to this. This is from the Zohar, Hekalot Breshit. It says um, talking about this concept of a royal robe and healing for all the ill and pain who have suffered with the Messiah. Eventually he, the Messiah, reappears and comforts them, those who have suffered. Lights and delights descending with him in which to revel, countless angels and chariots with him, each bearing a garment with which to clothe all the souls of the slain. They, there they delight while he ascends and descends. What do you think about that? The Messiah clothes the souls of the slain with these beautiful garments. That's exactly what we just read in Revelation 6, that they should each be given a white robe and told to rest for a little while until their brothers will reach the full number. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. Uh, let's see. Rest. Can we do a study on that word rest for a little while? Yeah, so there is obviously a heavenly version of rest. As we talked about consciousness earlier, maybe there is also a level of the that they could either maybe fall asleep in heaven or something but or is it like a sabbath and absorbing the presence of god true and and that is a jewish idea that in the lower garden of eden the souls of the righteous disembodied souls of the righteous are in the garden of eden um revelation 6 12 when he opened the sixth seal i saw that there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became as blood so uh, the David Stern says the description of the breaking of the sixth seal alludes to the descriptions that ended the world found in Isaiah 2:10 through 12, 2:19, 13:10, 34, 4, 53. I mean, he just goes on like multiple scriptures here. Um, the concept of an earthquake, we're going to learn later. You know, the book of Revelation says that there's an earthquake and it kills like 7,000 people. Have you, the, we'll, we'll discover this later. I was shocked. I was researching uh, fault lines in Jerusalem. And this was on uh, The Guardian, which is a British newspaper. And it said, you know, analysts say, and this is, this is not a joke, I shared this photo, and we'll share it later. Uh, when we reach that, I think it's in Revelation 11, it says, uh, analysts say that there could, there's going to be an earthquake in Israel. It's not a matter of if, but when, it can kill up to 7,000 people. And it uses the exact number of book Revelation. I'm going, what? Okay. The sun became black. In Isaiah 13, it says, For the stars of the heavens thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not give her light to shine. Joel 2.31, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of Hashem of hosts. Obviously, this darkness links to the darkness that happened over Egypt. It's also the judgment of the end. Um, scientifically, there are several ways that can happen, whether it's a nuclear winter, whether we're talking about a solar eclipse, whether we're talking about a lunar eclipse, whether we're talking about some type of um, 
A nuclear winter would be terrible, by the way. But I want you to hear this. This is Sukkah 29a in the Talmud. It says, our rabbis taught, when the sun is in eclipse, it is a bad omen for idolaters. When the moon is in eclipse, it's a bad omen for Israel, since Israel reckons by the moon and idolaters by the sun. If it is an eclipse in the east, it is a bad omen for those who dwell in the east. If it is in the west, it is a bad omen for those who dwell in the west. If it's in the midst of heaven, it is a bad omen for the whole world. If its face is as red as blood, it is a sign that a sword is coming to the world. If it is like sackcloth, the hours of famine are coming to the world. If it resembles both, the sword and arrows of famine are coming to the world. If the eclipse is at sunset, calamity will tarry in its coming. If it's at dawn, it hastens on its way. But some say the order is to be reversed. And there is no nation which is smitten that his gods are not smitten together with it, as it says, against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. But when Israel fulfill the will of the omnipresent, they have no need or no fear. They have need... They need to have no fear of all of these omens, as it is said, the Lord, thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the nations are dismayed at them, and the idolaters will be dismayed, but Israel will not be dismayed. Now that's very interesting because this concept of the moon is blood, which we just was we've read, everybody knows about the blood moons that happen April 15, 2014, October 8, 2014, which coincided with Sukkot, which is interesting because October 7th of 2023, April 4th, 2015, and September 28, 2015, and then we have a series of solar eclipses that have happened. We paused our service a couple months ago, went out and looked at this ring of fire solar eclipse. Now, eclipses are not that unusual. They do happen, obviously, astronomically. It's just a mathematical fact. Um, this was a tetrad, which is honestly still not that, I mean, it is a unique, but it does happen in a cycle over time. But what the rabbis are saying, rabbis are saying here is something not to be dismissed either, is the sun is an eclipse, is a bad omen for the nations, the moon is an eclipse, is a bad omen for Israel, since Israel reckons by the moon. But if you follow God's word, all of these signs mean Zippo, because, I mean, they mean something, but you have no need to fear them because Hashem protects you. The, um, the blood moon, um, I was, I was uh, listening to something two days ago, as a matter of fact. The scientists have taken, they've got photos of the moon and it's, it's starting to turn, it's got a red hue and they've hmm. determined that it's rust, that the, hmm. the moon is rusting and it's called Hematite, which is uh, hemo is blood. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Yeah, hematology is the study of blood. I haven't, uh, I haven't heard that. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. That's very interesting. Um, is the next solar eclipse going to happen in April? Is that um, Passover? I, it's really close to Passover. I don't know if it's on Passover, but the next one is coming up April something. Mm -hmm. Now, are these things like regional because? When eclipses happen, like solar eclipses, that kind of thing, not very many people even see it. It's That's just, right. It's just a strip across a very small geography. That's right. Of the world. Um, <coughs> so there are certain regional things, but when they say it happens in the east, it's a bad sign for those in the east. It happens in the west, bad yeah, sign for those what? It happens in the middle, it's a bad sign for everybody. Um, with that said, Revelation is saying that these heavenly signs are going to happen, and then the rabbis say, "Here's the interpretation of it." And that is not easily dismissed. Like, I want to tell you, I, I was kind of dismissive of the whole thing until I saw this, and then I was like, okay, I'll pay attention. And then all of these things just totally, totally happened uh, with COVID, but not only that, just everything else that was happening. If you remember 2020, it was like all of California was set on fire, and like various things were just totally... I don't know, just crazy things happening to the point you're just going, okay, what's next? What chapter we have? Revelation we in today? Revelation 6, 13, the stars fell of the sky fell to earth like a fig tree dropping its unripe figs when it is shaken by the wind. Isaiah chapter 34 says, and when the, when the New Testament quotes a passage, you need to go back and read the whole passage. I'm just going to read this poor, this part here. But when you read the whole passage, you're getting informed of the larger context of what they're quoting. 
So it says, the slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off a stench and the mountains will be drenched with blood and all the, he the host of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts will also wither away as a leaf withers from a vine, as one withers from the fig tree. For my sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it will descend judgment upon the dome and upon the people I have devoted to destruction. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. And it goes on in, in detail. Um, maybe I'm just reading something into this, but in Revelation 6, 14, it says, the sky was removed like a scroll when it's rolled up. Every mountain and island was moved out of their place. If you see a heaven, if you see something in the sky rolling like this, like coming up and rolling like this, to me, that's the exact cloud of a nuclear bomb. Okay, have you ever seen a nuclear bomb when it blows up? It, gets, it totally rolls exactly like a scroll. It, it goes like that and it just keeps rolling up. I could just be reading into this. It could be just a modern projection onto an ancient text. But nevertheless, you do see some kind of parallel there and this concept of the stars in the sky falling. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about asteroids and different things later. Um, but, you know, when, you know, a meteorite or something comes into the earth, you see it looks exactly like a star falling. But then again, this could refer to something spiritual, it could be referring to angelic entities, could be referring to different things. But whatever it's referring to, this is judgment upon the world because of lack of righteousness. So that's the bottom line about it is that um, Isaiah 34, these things will be rolled up. This is what Revelation 16, 14 is quoting. And uh, we see that these are going to happen, what apparently happens in successive stages that is happening over, over the, all the earth. So in my particular view, I do think first you have this person that comes, false prophet, false, uh, false messiah saying peace, peace. And peace, peace, sudden destruction happens, which is war. War leads to famine, economic instability. Famine leads to pestilence, leads to death. Death leads to, to the grave. So you're seeing this, I think, in successive stages um, in, in the earth. And I personally think this is probably going to break out pretty quick. I don't know if you know or if you're seeing some of the ruminations that are happening. You see the government flip, nearly flipped out of their seat the other day. Did you all see that? There was, a, there was a top secret briefing and every single person came out with their eyes this big and they said, we're asking President Biden to, to uh, declassify this whole thing so we could share it with the public. It's very scary, something Russia's doing. Someone leaked it, that Russia is planning on sending nukes into space where they can nuke um, satellites. But then the, the counter argument to this was- Is that the EMPs? Not the EMP, which EMP is a whole nother thing, okay. which is serious, but that if Russia were to put nukes into space and were to nuke our satellite mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. they could probably gain um, per strike capability. I don't know exactly what. They have supersonic missiles that can defeat anything. So something really shook them. On the counter argument, though, that people were saying this was a ploy in order to push the political uh, support for the, for the uh, Ukraine funding. Uh -huh. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really, I truly don't know. But one thing I know is that Russia is Gog and Magog. Mm -hmm. And we're going to show that later. With that said, um, there's, there's some serious things there. So maybe two things are true at once. I don't know. Okay. Um, so Revelation 16, they told the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the faith, the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So first of all, in Hosea chapter 10, it says the high places also of Avin, the sin of Israel, Avin means sin, Avon, uh, will be destroyed and the thorn of the thistle will come up on their altars. They will tell the mountains, cover us and on the hills, fall on us. That's Hosea chapter 10. Fall on us to cover us from the wrath of the lamb. This is a one commentary and I found this to be powerful. Craig Keener says, lambs were particularly docile creatures. The wrath of the lamb is thus a jarring image. Um, that is stunning to hear that phrase. I would have put the wrath of the lion. They're putting the wrath of the lamb because the New Testament is consistently showing you the fusion between Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, which we talked about last week when it says the lion is the lamb, 
Messiah, son of David, is Messiah, son of Joseph. And you have this fusion here. But this idea of the wrath of the lamb, that even sounds scarier than the wrath of the lion. Because because that, if people are saying, I want to hide from this. And then listen to this in 1st Enoch 62. And we're coming to the last last verse and we have five five minutes or four minutes. Revelation 6, 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Psalm 76 says, you, even you are to be feared. Who can stand in your sight when you are angry? First Enoch 62, verse nine says, and all the kings and all the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall down before him on their faces and worship and set their hope upon that son of man and petition him and supplicate for his mercy at his hands. Nevertheless, that Lord of spirits will press them so that they shall hastily go forth from his presence and their faces shall be filled with shame and darkness shall grow deeper on their faces and he will deliver them to the angels for punishment to execute vengeance on them because they have oppressed his children and his elect. And they shall be a spectacle for the righteous and for his elect and they shall rejoice over them because the wrath of the Lord of spirits rests on them and his sword is drunk with their blood. So Revelation chapter, I mean, uh, First Enoch 62 is directly parallel that the kings of the earth, the princes, the commanding officers, the rich, the strong, everybody is saying, hey, I want to hide from this because this is, this is, um, this is serious. Really quick, has, has anybody seen the like CNN articles on billionaire bunkers? Mm-hmm. Look it up. It's actually pretty awesome looking, man. I would love to have a billionaire bunker. But there are... Um, Lots of billionaires, lots of really, really elite people are building right now Look, what looked like elegant, super awesome looking underground bunkers in preparation for the apocalypse. They're doing that right now. Like that's like in CNN. Um, that says to me that these people are privy to, to know that um, the powers that be are going to bring these horrible things on the earth. That's right. There's like insider trading. This mm-hmm. is like insider knowledge of... But honestly, it's kind of obvious. Like, you can kind of see where this is going. If you just trace it out, and that's what we're going to do in future classes, as we're, and we did this one year at Beta Derek, but I want to show this on a more granular level and a more detailed level, is trace out certain trajectories, political, economic, medical, uh, uh, eco- uh, 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 geopolitical, and, um, and just scientific in general, and oh, and digital as well. You see where all of this is going, you can basically trace it out. And the shocking thing about it is, if just, just following trend lines, you will arrive directly where Revelation says we're going. And, and to me, it's amazing because I wasn't like raised a believer. And so when I see this, when I like see evidence of like, okay, this guy existed, even though I believe he existed, but like, like it says, here's the reference to that in the Bible. I get fascinated. So like, in, for instance, like in Romans, Paul says, hey, say hi to Herastus, the city treasurer for me in, in Corinth. They found his name like in a, like in a, like it says Erastus, the, the city manager or whatever. And, and the, I find stuff like that fascinating. So I also find it fascinating when the book of Revelation tells you what the end of days looks like. And then you trace out the trajectories of different, um, different segments of society, uh, whether it's geopolitical, societal, uh, economic, medical, uh, digital, or you look at all of these things and it all culminates into the exact position where we're at. And then moreover, the rabbis interpret and say, this is what this means. And then we see that in our own days. To me, I would challenge any atheist, any atheist to explain this to me. Uh, please explain this to me because I have, still have a very skeptical mind. Like I just don't believe anything. Like I, I weigh it out, um, and I want somebody to explain what is the atheist position on this. How do you explain it? Because I've looked into this and I can't explain it except for one thing: the New Testament is true. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is real. Yeshua is the Messiah. He's about to return, and it's time for all of us to repent and get ready for this. And so this preparation aspect of it, as we're reading Revelation, we're going to be talking about what are some practical things we can do to prepare for this? Because it's, it's um, and even on a congregational and just like personal level, every single person should prepare for this. First, spiritually. So repentance, 
teshuvah, tzedakah, tefillah, repentance, charity, righteousness, and, and, um, and prayer. Number one, that's above all. Number two, emotionally, mentally. Because some of the things that we're going to see in the world is going to be very emotionally distressing. Um, I was very distressed today. Here's something that just still coming at news coming out of October 11th, October 7th. Still so many things that are so distressing from that. And then to see the things that are coming up upon this nation, upon the earth, upon the things that are happening, we need to prepare ourselves mentally, emotionally, and be, and be tough. And I'm not a very tough person when it comes to mental, emotional stuff, so I need to like kick it into gear. Next, physically, get healthy, get physically healthy. Like get, you know, get physically positioned. Financially, get financially out of debt. Get, get certain things in hand. Have some goals. Not that you trust in any of these things, but it's better if you have these points covered and then nothing happens <laughs> versus something happened and you don't have any of these points covered. That's what some people we did for Y2K. We prepared just to prepare because we would be prepared if something happened. Nobody gets hurt as long as you're not like, you know, starting a cult or something. You know, it's like, it's it's very wise to prepare. Joseph prepared. It's time for us to prepare. That's a fact. And if you don't prepare and something happens, then you're in trouble. If you do prepare and nothing happens, then then you're actually a lot better off. Well, anyway. that's like the virgins and the oil. That's it. Right. That's it. The, the five virgins, five foolish, five wise virgins. We need to be the five wise virgins, and we need to cover that parable in the study of Revelation as we explore these next, uh, these next chapters coming up. So with that, do we have any other questions? I, I have one statement that's, I don't know. Could you help me with this? Could there, is there any connection um, in, let's see, the sixth seal, terror? Um, the stars of the sky fell to the earth. So God told Abraham that his descendants would be as the stars. Is there a connection? As a fig tree cast its unripe figs when it's shaken by a great wind, and the fig tree represents Israel. Probably. That's that's probably a really good comment, and I, I haven't explored that, but there's got to be something there that's there's got to be um i haven't thought about it in that angle the fig tree does represent <laughs> israel that's a fact stars do represent the children but stars can also represent angels and the stars can be physical things as well um but the fig tree connection i think that's that's well, very interesting the fig tree connection and the stars together since god had told abraham his children his descendants would be as the stars of the sky yeah i think um I think there's something to that. So uh, that deserves f further exploration. I don't know the answer. But that's really good, though. That's a really good connection that we deserve to look into that. Um, any other comments? I was going to read online to see if anybody had any comments. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions that we have. Uh, yeah, it could be could be satellites too if they get nuked. I guess I don't know, um, but and I do think that ultimately there's there's the, many of these things function on a multi layer oh, yeah. thing. So one thing maybe it just doesn't mean one thing; it means multiple, multiple the different. Torah has seventy facets. Yes, that's right. Shavim panim la Torah. There are seventy facets to the Torah. Okay. Any other questions? Any other thing? Well. I'm, I'm really enjoying this because there's so many things I'm, I'm learning because I'm just realizing I know Zippo about the book of Revelation and the more we study the more we're looking into this um, it's going to get even crazier next week so it's going even wilder so we're just like I think all the way up until like last week we we're just doing an introduction and then we get this vision of heaven the lamb who is the lion open in the seals and now we have the beginning of these four horsemen going out breaking all six seals will break the seventh seal in, in chapter eight and then it then it unrolls we're gonna we got so many things to talk about russia iran antichrist who rabbis call armalis who uh, the muslims call the dajjal um there's just multiple multiple levels we're going to be exploring with that uh the reestablishment of the state of israel which is critical 
Um, and a, another key that shows us that we're in de definitely in the last days. And we'll, I think we're going to show that unequivocally based on a Rashi comment on Ezekiel 36. And he says, when you see the land of Israel become fertile, know this, that there is no clearer sign the Messiah is about to come. And we're there. So with that, uh, we'll explore that in future chapters. So I guess we'll pray. And then we'll close out the book of Revelation, chapter 6. Chapter 7, homework would be to go read 7 and study it. Um, I'm, I'm going to study this thing out with the fig tree. There's something there. Uh, obviously, it's quoting uh, Isaiah 34, but that's a great question and, and it deserves exploration. All right, well, let's pray. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, please give us wisdom, Lord, on how to pray, mm -hmm. uh, how to pray for all the things that we need to be doing, but also how to prepare for all the things we need to do. Just like Joseph prepared for the seven-year tribulation of Egypt, may we prepare for the seven-year tribulation of the world, not in a way that's unbalanced or, or, or not holy, but in a way that honors you, but also that we proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that you will help us, Lord, embrace your truth, help us be bold voices for your truth, for your Holy Son, Yeshua, for your people Israel, for, uh, for the Torah, for the gospel, for the temple, for repentance, for prayer, for tzedakah. And Lord, just help us be righteous people. May we be prepared spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, in every single way. Mm -hmm. And may you give us wisdom and help us, Lord, uh, make good decisions that reflect you and represent you well to sanctify your name. And Lord, give us strength and wisdom and enable us to accomplish your will in these days. And we thank you, Lord, for choosing us to live in the days that we're going to see the return of your Holy Son. You have chosen us for this time. And Lord, may we use, uh, may, may we realize the responsibility that is, that we can proclaim your name and uh, be a bold witness for you in these last days. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord, in the merit of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen, amen. Amen. Shalom, shalom.